Professor Post, what happened last week, June 23rd? It's We all felt that that day it was going to be a whole change in the political sphere, in the global sphere. Everyone was talking about nuclear war. Everyone was talking about Vladimir Putin being removed from office. So take me through your live insights. You know, it's right that day. What happened in your mind? And we, we can uncover that as we go. Absolutely. I think that's a great way to approach this because I, just like everybody else, was having very much a moment of what is going on. Things are unfolding in real time. I mean, in many ways, it, it, it illustrated the value of like social media because you could actually get the real time updates and see and, and information's coming in. And you could try to follow. Of course, you're trying to figure out like, well, what's happening? What's not? And even like very credible sources, folks are not sure exactly what's unfolding. But I think we now have a, a bit of a sense of what was happening. And now, having said that, everything we're talking about is subject to change, right? Because we're still trying to get a sense of what were the motivations of everybody involved and exactly what was it that ended what we were witnessing. We're still getting a sense for that, but we can at least take a step back and kind of walk through what exactly happened. So of course, you know, last Friday into Saturday, we're hearing about, about this rebellion, mutiny, insurrection. It's really hard to even say what word we should be using to describe it. But in a nutshell, what occurred was the Wagner Group, this organization that people refer to as a private military uh, corporation, PMC, but they're not in the same sense. They're not a PMC in the same sense as we would think about some of them like a Blackwater back in the day. Of course, that was the PMC that was infamous for the Abu Ghraib back in 2007, 2008. They don't operate in that way. Mm-hmm. They're really what they are is they are a mechanism by which the Russian government is able to engage in some unsavory uh, operations, both in Ukraine and elsewhere. And do so in a way that allows them to kind of be at arm's length, to have some plausible deniability about their involvement. So this Wagner group came into existence in 2014 following Russia's annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. And of course, that was also done in a manner that was kind of, you know, they used what they called the little green men, which was Russian soldiers, but didn't have their patch face on, didn't have their insignia. So it was like unclear who exactly was carrying this out. But this Wagner group was created in 2014 and the main purpose of it was to help start carrying out a lot of the insurgency that was occurring in eastern ukraine so not even so much the crimean peninsula but in the eastern provinces of ukraine of course there's been this ongoing civil war separatist movement fighting that's been going on since 2014 2015 and Again, Russia was able to kind of claim that they weren't directly involved. And the reason why was because a lot of the support that Russia was providing was through this group called the Wagner Group. Mm. And so that's a lot of what this organization was about. And ever since they, well, I should say they got started in Ukraine and then they started expanding their operations, franchising, if you will, into Syria, into various countries in Africa. And again, the purpose is to allow Russia to have some military involvement in in these locations, but kind of deny direct military participation. So that was kind of the purpose of the Wagner. But ever since the invasion, the full invasion of Ukraine last February, the Wagner Group has kind of pivoted to becoming more involved and in more explicitly directly involved in major military operations by the Russian government and have been working more closely in cooperation with the Russian military. They've been taking on a major role in some of the military operations, most notably the Battle of Bakhmut that, of course, had been taking place over the past several months in this eastern city that kind of became a focal point of the fighting that's been taking place um, for the past half year. And this battle was a very pitched battle a lot of casualties on both sides. There was even questions about why is Ukraine even trying to hold on to this city? And of course, Russia's trying to tank this city. 
Eventually, Russia does take this city, but it's taken in a way that's kind of referred to as a Pyrrhic victory. It was like, yes, they achieved it, but at what cost? And that really wrapped up in May. The reason why that matters, though, is because, as I was just indicating, the Wagner Group, they played a leading role in that battle. And then they actually took on most of the casualties in that battle. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of probably 20,000 men are estimated to have been killed during that battle. Wow. And that's, that's real important for a couple reasons. First reason is it illustrates kind of the shift in strategy that Russia has been taking during this war. Russia has not been, the war in a nutshell has not been going as planned. Uh, you know, it's referred to as the special military operation. The expectation is it would be rather short. It hasn't gone that way. They've run into personnel problems. They need more manpower, to be frank. And the way that they were able to start acquiring that was both through a major military mobilization that occurred in the fall, but also by organizations like the Wagner Group recruiting and were the Wagner Group's and recruiting from prisons. And they've been bringing in, you know, the, the, the Russian government's been willing to allow pardons to various individuals in Russian prisons as long as they then join this group and engage in the fighting. And so what you have is you have these prisoners who are signing up, joining the Wagner group, and then they were going to Bakhmut to engage in this fight. And that is a, that's one key thing about why this battle is important, is it really illustrates kind of the Russian overall military strategy. But the other reason why it's important is following this battle, this did two things for the Wagner group. First of all, the Wagner group, and in particular, their leader, Prigozhin, who everybody has by now talked about and has a, a sense of who this person is, he was very unhappy with how that fight went. He felt that the Russian Ministry of Defense was undersupplying his troops, and he was very vocal about needing more ammunition. Despite all that, they did achieve this Pyrrhic victory. And so that also put the Wagner group in a position of having a bit of leverage, of being able to say, look, you kind of need us. So they're not happy with how the war is being conducted, and they now have a position where they feel like they have some leverage. That put, I think, the Ministry of Defense in a bit of an uncomfortable situation. And in particular, you have the Minister of Defense, Shoigu, he, in early June, issued an order to bring these private military organizations, again, they're not PMCs in the same way, but organizations like Wagner Group, he wanted to kind of end this arms length relationship and formally bring them under the control of the Ministry of Defense. Basically, force these people who were working for the Wagner Group to now sign contracts with the Ministry of Defense. And the reason why is because they're a bit of a concern about how they were conducting they're fighting, but also as a way to kind of take away this leverage that these groups now felt like they had. And of course, the Wagner group, they don't want that. They don't want to be brought under the Ministry of Defense. That dispute was taking place throughout June, even weeks before that, and it came to a head last week. That's what ultimately happened, was that you had this dispute about how things should be organized, who should be calling the shots, who should have control. And kind of inexplicably, we're still trying to get a sense of why. Bergosian thought that the best bargaining tactic that he could use in this dispute was not to just tell his troops not to fight, not to voice his displeasure, but to actually turn his troops and march them towards Moscow. Wow. And that was, that was what happened, was that this dispute between the Ministry of Defense and the Bogner group that was brought to a head in light of the Battle of Bakhmut led to what we saw last weekend, where Purgosian took this extreme measure of not just voicing displeasure, not just refusing to fight, but actually saying, no, we're going to turn our forces towards Moscow. Now, this has been the big thing that surprised everybody because, you know, kind of as the movie, the famous line from the movie, Inkerman, that escalated quickly. I, I mean, that just, it just escalated so quickly. People were like, what, what is he thinking? What, what, is, what is he hoping to achieve? And what was clear was that I didn't think he knew what he wanted to achieve. You know, the, the analogy I've used is kind of as people talk about when like a dog is chasing a car and people are always like, well, what's going to happen when the dog catches the car, right? I mean, it's not going to know what to do. I think that's actually what happened here was that 
Prigozhin made this decision, perhaps irrational. Maybe he was just totally angry, angry at his boss, angry at the Ministry of Defense, angry, and he made this decision to march on Moscow. And then about eight hours into that, 10 hours into that, he had a moment of clarity of, wait, what am I doing? This doesn't make any sense. We, we, and then they stopped, right? And then they ended up, they stopped. They stopped about 200 kilometers from Moscow. And then that led to the deal where apparently both he decided, no, I wasn't trying to overthrow Putin. And I was just trying to make a point. It was a protest. He literally called it a protest. But at the same time, Putin himself also was like, well, they're traitors, but we're not going to do anything about it. We're going to allow Prigozhin to go to Belarus. Um, I'm going to encourage the people who participated in this, though I'm upset that you participated, you have the opportunity to actually sign contracts with the Ministry of Defense. And then everything was kind of forgiven. So that's just, you know, uh, I know there's a lot of detail there, but that kind of gives you the overview of both what is the Wagner Group and what were they doing and how that then set the conditions for what we witnessed this past weekend. But at the end of the day, what we witnessed this past weekend was really, for lack of a better phrase, a bargaining tactic by the Wagner Group. But I think one that was so extreme that they even realized they had to back down from it. Professor Post, wow, thank you. Thank you for, for those insights. You know, but it's at face value while everything was happening. The first impression for me personally was, is this a military coup against Putin? Is, is Are they trying to overthrow him? And, you know, you mentioned that perhaps this was an irrational decision by, I'm going to botch his name, Prigozhin? Prigozhin? Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, perfect. But because I didn't even know Prigozhin before this, and for what I understand, you know, the Western perspective, I, I would love to also, this is another question, but from the Western perspective, from our perspective in this side of the equation of this side of the globe was that everyone was really rallying around Putin in this in his war against Ukraine and in his expansion, you know, towards other territories or whatever he wanted to do. His political power was very placed in check. Everyone was with him. And so Prigozhin comes to the equation and it seems that there's a whole different story, a whole different thing that really I don't I've never read about this in neither in the coverage of, you know, the war of Ukraine, there wasn't really this other side that perhaps there's someone else that wants the power. So was the outcome, the ultimate outcome for you, an unknown unknown, was it a big, a big surprise that everything just halted like the way it did with Belarus, just negotiating a, a, a peace deal between them? And then Prigozhin saying, we don't want to have any Russian bloodshed. We don't want to, you know, kill any one of our allies, or our people. Was that a surprise for you? And what were all other outcomes that you would seem deem possible that would have happened, you know, because this really escalated quickly and it ended as quickly. So I think it's surprising. The The outcome was surprising in the sense that Russian society is a society where um, if you make the wrong expression regarding, say, LBGTQ, um, activism, you could be sent to prison, right? I mean, this is a society that is not an open society. And so when you do something like that, you can be sent to prison. And yet here's somebody who flat out committed a mutiny. And he's like, well, we're going to forget, right? We're just, we're not, you know, and I mean, that's the many thing that's surprising. It wasn't so much surprising that he decided to stop. I do think he had this moment of clarity. I think the thing that's been surprising to people is that Putin was also like, oh, yeah, OK, you know, yes, I know I said you were a traitor and yes, you didn't you need. But you know what? It, it's OK. I'm going to go ahead and let this go. And again, this is not a society that, that is like the standard in terms of punishment. You can go to prison much less than trying to commit a mutiny. And yet that's not what happened. Now, big caveat is we still don't ultimately know what's going to happen for Goshen, right? I mean, he's currently in a hotel where um, there's no windows, right? And and the reason why is because there's concerns about the fact that Putin does have this track record of eliminating people who are, um, you know, who create issues for him, right? And there's still that possibility. So even though right now it looks like Putin is just letting this go, and just forgiving this, 
there's still the possibility that he could actually, you know, take a measure like having him executed. That could still happen. And that's why, you know, it's always tricky to talk about these things as they're unfolding in real time. But having said that, um, I think what's on the one hand, it's Putin's reaction is unsu- is is surprising given what happened and given, you know, kind of the the way that people could be sent to prison in Russia. But on the other hand, it actually makes a lot of sense what Putin did in terms of deciding, you know what, I'm not going to prosecute. I'm not going to have criminal charges put against the Wagner group. And the reason why is very practical. He needs them. He needs this personnel. He maybe doesn't want, I think, you know, as we're getting more and more information, it seems clear that they do want to try to eliminate the Wagner group as an organization that still seems to be in play. And it does seem like Prigozhin is sidelined, but in Putin's own address, when he talked about what happened, I think this was his Monday address or Tuesday address, he talked about how, you know, for those who participated in this mutiny, and I think he used he used the phrase mutiny, um, he said, you have three options. You can go home, you can go to Belarus, or you can sign a contract and join the Russian military. And he even said, I hope that, he basically said, I hope you do the, the third. Right. He's like, I hope that you become warriors for Russia, because I think what that points to is that he has a recognition because of the things we talked about with the Battle of Bakhmut. He has a recognition that he can't afford to throw all these people in prison. He can't afford to take to send them back to prison. Remember, because a lot of them came from prison. Right? He's like, he can't afford to do that because he needs this personnel. And you know, Russia is in a situation where they need these personnel. So I think that that helps explain a little bit about why Putin was willing to just say, you know what, I know that this is like you were committing a mutiny, but we're going to just let this go, right? And I think it's because he's in this situation where he actually needs their help. 